Okay, in this video I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on magnetostatics. This is video number 13 and I'm going to discuss bound currents. I've written the titles of the previous 12 videos in the bottom left and top right of your screen. Now in order to discuss bound currents we also need uh, additional videos from other sections. In my section on vector calculus for electromagnetism we require the results of videos 18, 20 and 42. In my series on electrostatics, I discussed bound charges in videos 36 and 37, and I strongly suggest that you watch videos 36 and 37 in that section prior to watching this current video on bound currents. And the reason for that is as follows. If you understand electrostatics, the generalization then or the, the later discussion of magnetostatics follows quite straightforward. And what we found in videos 36 and 37 are electrostatics is that when we apply an external electric field to a body we get what's known as electric polarization. And we always want to calculate what this polarization field is and we found that the total polarization field is equivalent to calculating the field made by what are known as bound surface and volume charges. And of course, I'm sure you see that that's what's going to happen when we discuss bound surface and volume currents. So we're trying to calculate the field when we apply a magnetic field to a body. We see that we get a magnetic polarization, which is a result of uh, both magnetic uh, volume currents and magnetic surface currents. And we try and calculate the field associated with them. So let's begin. A single orbiting electron can be thought of as a magnetic dipole and the magnetic vector potential of a single dipole is written on the top left of your screen. So it's mu zero over 4 pi and then we have the magnetic dipole moment crossed with the magnetic unit vector or excuse me the separation unit vector divided by the square of the magnitude of the separation vector. Now we know that the magnetization is equal to the magnetic dipole moment per unit volume. So that means that the capital M is equal to mu over the volume. Now we know of course that M is a function of the unprimed coordinates. Now in a magnetized object each volume element d tau prime carries a dipole moment equal in magnitude to the magnetization capital M multiplied by d tau prime. So this implies that the total magnetic vector potential on a magnetized object due to many magnet magnetic dipole moments is simply going to be this particular integral. Now just like when we discussed uh, bound uh, electric charges, we have the answer for the bound magnetic uh, currents here. It's, it's pretty straightforward. We have the magnetic vector potential. Calculating the field should be straightforward. However, this doesn't have a readily um, visible physical interpretation. And what I'd like to do is perform a small bit of mathematics, a bit of a sleight of hand, in order to present this in an easily, uh, an easily accessible physical interpretation, or with an easily accessible physical interpretation. You should guess, of course, that we're going to result with bound volume and surface currents. So the first thing we need to do is look at the results from video 18 on vector calculus for electromagnetism where we proved or derived the following pro uh, vector product. Now in order for us to apply this vector product I'm going to rewrite the formula or the integral for the total magnetic vector potential of a magnetized object by bringing the magnitude of the separation vector to be squared directly under the separation unit vector. And thereafter, I'm going to, uh, I, thereafter, I'd like to note another result from our series on vector calculus for electromagnetism. And I've written it here. Essentially, what we can do is we can swap the separation unit vector divided by the square of the magnitude of the separation vector by the primed gradient of 1 over the magnitude of the separation vector. Thereafter, I apply the result of the product rule and I get the formula for the magnetic vector potential as written on the bottom left of your screen. 
So once again, we could leave it like this. However, it hasn't recast the problem in, into a simpler form. It is, there's no readily uh, visible physical interpretation as of yet. And now I'm going to give you a bit of a health warning. It does get kind of hairy for the next couple of lines. So I'm going to need to derive three different uh, equations here, which we're going to apply to the formula for the magnetic vector potential of the magnetized object. Just before I do that, I need to point out something, just to remind you that the cross products that we're computing here, the curls we're computing here, are with respect to the primed coordinates rather than the unprimed coordinates. And I know I've given a, a prime on the magnetic vector potential here, but it that is actually unprimed, but it is a function of the primed coordinates in some way. So the divergence theorem is written on the top right of your screen. It says that when we take the volume integral of the divergence of a vector field, let's say capital A, it's equivalent to calculating the closed surface integral of the vector field dotted with the infinitesimal surface area element. I'm going to call this equation number one. Now one of the first things you will have derived when you start studying vector calculus is the following series of equations written here. So if we take vector fields A, B and C, if we take the divergence, or excuse me, the dot product between the curl of B and C and the vector field A, it's equivalent to taking the dot product between B and the curl or the cross product of C and A. And it's equivalent to taking C dotted with the cross product of A and B. So if you look closely, we can see that the, just the, it's kind of like the indices moving along. Now later on, we will be looking at taking the dot product between the cross product of A and B and the infinitesimal surface area element dA. So what I do is I rearrange it such that we have dA dotted with A cross B. Thereafter, I apply the results written up here. So we get B dotted with the cross product of dA and capital A. Or we can swap the order of the cross product if we incorporate A minus sign. So what we're saying is that a cross b dotted with the infinitesimal surface area element is equivalent to minus b outside of the excuse me minus b dotted with capital A cross d a. This is what I'm going to call equation number two. Now the result from vector calculus for electromagnetism video twenty is written here. Now if if the vector field B is a constant vector, the curl of vector field B is going to be zero. So if we've chosen B to be a constant vector field, then simply the divergence of A cross B is going to be B dotted with the curl of A. And I'm going to call that equation number three. So now what we've done is calculated the three subcomponents which we require in order to give a physical interpretation to the magnetic vector potential of a magnetized object. So let's start putting the three of these together. On the top left of your screen, I've rewritten the divergence theorem, which I call equation number one. Now let's say that we, are, we exchange the vector field A with another vector field, which I'm going to call the curl of A and B, or the, excuse me, the cross product of A and B. So simply we're going to have the following equation, which is still the divergence theorem, is the divergence theorem for a vector field A cross B. The next thing I'm going to do is invoke the results from equations 3 and 2. So here we're looking at taking the divergence of the vector field A cross B. And we look at equation number 3 down here. And that's exactly what we have. So we can exchange that with B dotted with the curl of A. And if we look at here, we're taking the closed surface integral of A cross B dotted with the infinitesimal surface area element. And simply, if we look at equation number two, that's going to be minus B dotted with capital A crossed with the infinitesimal surface area element. Now, as I said a moment ago, B is in actual fact a constant vector field. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take B outside of the integral itself. 
And thereafter, I realized, in actual fact, B is, uh, is inconsequential here. It doesn't matter, so I get rid of B. And we're left with the following equation. So that the, the, uh, volume, uh, uh, the volume integral of the curl of A is equal to minus the closed surface integral of A cross with the infinitesimal surface area element. So really what we see is the introduction of the constant vector field B was nothing less than a sleight of hand. We just have one more manipulation to make before we can go back to our magnetic vector potential. So I've rewritten that particular form on the top right of your screen, the one we've just der derived. Now if we just go back to what we had for the magnetic vector potential, look at this term down here where we're taking the cross product of the primed nabla and the magnetization divided by the magnitude of the separation vector. So really what we're looking at here is the, what I'm calling the vector field capital A so far up here is in actual fact M over the magnitude of the separation vector. So putting it all together I can rewrite the uh, I can rewrite this I'm going to call it equation number four. And now we're ready to go back to the uh, magnetic vector potential. So I've rewritten on the top left of your screen the magnetic vector potential as we left it last. Now what I'm going to do is using equation number four I'm going to rewrite this particular equation and, and its, its result is down here. The important or interesting point to note here is that it's, it's gone from having a minus sign to a plus sign. And this is the magnitude of the magnetic vector potential of a magnetized object. Notice, of course, we have a volume integral and a surface integral of currents. So this leads us to the conclusion that we're dealing with a volume current and a surface current. And they're, of course, bound. So we're talking about J-bound, which is the bound volume current. And that seems to be the primed curl of the magnetization. And we're talking about the bound surface current, which seems to be the curl of the primed mag uh, magnetization and the uh, normal vector n hat. So the magnetic vector potential capital A and the magnetic field capital B from magnetization using an applied field is the same as would be produced by the a bound current of J sub B and a bound surface uh, current, a bound volume current, excuse me, a bound surface current. And of course when we say we're talking about bound current where it's bound to the particular uh, it's bound to the particular uh, material because each atom is bound, or excuse me, each electron is bound to a particular atom and each electron constitutes a current. So what this means is that when we magnetize an object, let's say a paramagnetic or a diamagnetic object, by applying an external magnetic field and we want to calculate the resultant magnetization field, what we do is we calculate the field due to the volume current and the field due to the surface current and we just add them. So just like when we were discussing electric polarization, I'd like to give a physical interpretation of these particular currents. Let's start with the bound surface current K sub B. We know of course that an arbitrary current loop can be approximated as a series of small current loops. So if, if, our, if in the orange is, is our material, then we can consider this to be a series of electron, uh, electronic loops themselves. And if you look closely, the reason we can do this is because the internal loops all cancel. And I've written that the, cancel, the loops that cancel in black, or the line segments which cancel in black, and the ones which don't uh, are, are drawn in purple. Note that direction of the magnetization is perpendicular to the, uh, to the material itself, and we have a thickness of small t. So the result is that we have a current which is going around the material, it's got a magnetization, and I've also noted the, uh, the normal vector as well. The thickness, of course, is T. Now you might say to yourself, so what? What, what, what difference of it, it does it make that each of the internal loops cancel out and we have this, this net current loop on the on their edges? Well, each current loop is, of course, a magnetic dipole, and the magnetic dipole is I the current times the, the, uh, the area vector. So M, the magnetization, is the magnetic dipole moment per unit volume. So we can re-express the dipole moment as I times A or M times V. 
but we know the volume of course is simply going to be the area of our element multiplied by its thickness which I have introduced down here. So the result here is that we get the, the, uh, the current is nothing more than the magnetization multiplied by the thickness of your sample. We can of course easily extend this to the total current because the currents obey, obey excuse me, the superposition principle. So the total current on our surface, the one that's over here, because all the others have cancelled, is nothing else but the total magnetization multiplied by the thickness of the sample. But by definition, the bound surface current is nothing more, or excuse me, the surface current is nothing more than di dl perpendicular. But in this case, dl perpendicular is going to be the thickness. So we divide the current by the thickness. And seeing that, that means that the, the bound surface current is nothing else but the magnetization. And if we look closely, we can rewrite this using its the, the, the direction. And that means that k, the bound surface current, is equal to the magnetization crossed with the unit normal. And that's exactly what we found by a more rigorous method earlier on. The bound volume currents are slightly more involved, however, and involves a geometric interpretation, of course, because it results in a cross product. Let's imagine a current in a non-uniform magnetization, whereby the magnetization of a sample is different from the magnetization of the next sample. So I've drawn my Cartesian coordinate system, noting my x, my y, and my z axes. And let's say that we have a magnetization m here, but we have a greater magnetization which I've given by m double plus. Of course we're going to have different currents as well as, as a result. The separation between the two samples is of course in the x direction, so that's going to be dx, and their height is of course in the z direction, so the, the, the sep in the z direction is dz. So just once more to recap, we're having adjacent magnetic magnetized pieces of different magnetization. I'm going to call it M and M++. So let's see if we can calculate the actual magnetization. And I've written that on the top right of your screen. So the magnetization of the lesser magnetized object is going to be in the Z direction. And it's going to be a function of X. That should be pretty straightforward. And similarly, M++ is going to be uh, in the Z direction. And it's going to be a function of X plus DX. Now, we saw a moment ago that the surface current is di dl perpendicular, which led us to say that, it, that the bound surface current was nothing more than the magnetization. So what, what can we say about the bound volume current? Now, we know that in a magnetized object, each volume element d tau prime carries a dipole moment of m d tau prime. So really what we're saying here is that if we look at the current in the magnitude of the current in the y direction, it's going to be nothing more than the difference in the magnetization multiplied by dz. Or we can introduce the, uh, the partial derivative with respect to x as well, here and here, which allows us to rewrite the magnitude of the current in the y direction as del m sub z del x multiplied by dx dz. But if we think about the volume current density, that's nothing more than di dA perpendicular which is going to be i over dx dz. So if we look at that, we see that the bound surface, excuse me, the bound volume current in the x direction is going to be dm sub z, or del m sub z, del x. And perhaps you're getting a bit confused. I certainly was the first time I looked at it, but uh, I think if you just sit back and think about it, that, that should make some form of sense to you. Now, we need to complete this. So let's instead think about the following arrangement of the magnetized uh, segments. So once again, we're in a non-uniform non magnetization, but we're thinking about the following two uh, mag magnetized segments above each other rather than beside each other. This time, the separation between them is going to be in the z direction, and the magnetization is going to be in the y direction again. So nothing here really has changed except their positions and the analysis is of course going to be the same. This time the magnetization for the lesser magnetized object is going to be in uh, it's going to be in the x direction and a function of z 
and m plus plus is going to be in the x direction and a function of z plus dz. So applying the same logic, we find that the the uh, current in the y direction is going to be m, m sub x, z plus dz minus m sub x of z, multiplied by d dz. Of course, this actually was a typo here, so I've, I've changed that to, to tx as it should be. And applying the same logic as we did in the previous, we introduced the partial derivative with respect to z, multiplying above and below by dz. And we know, of course, what the vo the, the volume surface current is, or the, excuse me, the, the, um, the volume current is. That's i over dA perpendicular. And we see that uh, j bound is going to be del m sub x del z. So putting them both together, we find that the bound volume current in the y direction is del m sub z del x minus del m sub x del z. Well, this of course is a cross product, and I'm sure if you if you uh, cared, you could very much compute this in each of the other directions, and you'd see that in fact this is certainly a cross product. So I suppose this is just trying to show a physical argument as to why the mathematical argument was in fact valid. So thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends. Subscribe to my channel. And it might also give me a comment in the comment box below.